Thanks so much for tuning in to another episode of the CIS Podcast. I'm here with my good friend, Ross King. And, you know, Ross and I talk a lot. And honestly, we talk about all kinds of things from business ideas to family to food to the office and many, many, many things in between that. But one thing we spend a lot of time talking about is all things Christian indie artists and songwriters. And lo and behold, that's this podcast. So we had this idea that since we talk about it, let's start letting people into these conversations because we feel like there's a lot to glean. You know, Ross has been doing this for 30 years. I've been doing this for a while myself, and we just want to help people on their journeys. So in that, we're just going to start sharing, and this will kind of be the format of this podcast for the foreseeable future, and we hope that you guys get a lot out of it. But without further ado, we want to talk about something cool today. I know something that I've really leaned into on my own personal journey, and you know, I'm going to let him talk through it. Ross, take it away and let him know what, what we're talking about today. Yeah, yeah. So as, as you said, you know, we spend so much time talking just to help each other yeah. or just to kind of vent or whatever through our careers. And it makes sense that as we're both trying to find content to help people and to move our careers forward and all that, it just makes sense to, to record some of these conversations. So one of, the, one of the main things that I talk about when Brian and I are talking and one of the main things in, that I discuss in my coaching and in, and in my own songwriting, honestly, um, this is where this was birthed, is this idea of a quality control and, and what I sort of, you know, jokingly call the suck meter. Like, you know, that, that we have to have some sense of how good or not good the various parts of our career are, the various output, where we're strong and where, where, where we're weak. Do we have an honest authentic kind of correct view of ourselves. And, you know, this, this is bigger than music. This is like in life. We, you know, we're always working to figure out if we talk too much or if we <laughs> let people step all over us in business or if we're, you know, too quick to, to get angry or something. Right. But, but, but in music and in creativity and in, and in the um, music career space, as independents, there's this void in our work because if you are a signed artist, which that's what all of us picture when we think about musicians. We, th we think about musicians that are signed and on the radio and that we've seen and heard. Yep. And when we think about, about that stuff, they have built in to their careers gatekeepers. It's subjective, but they are gatekeepers who insert opinions about what should and should not be allowed to be heard by the public or whatever, right? So yeah. that, that's their A&R, which just stands for Artists and re Repertoire, which is just record label people saying, here are the songs you should you know, write, and here's the kind of sound we're looking for, and that lyric doesn't work, or whatever. And then they have publishers often. You know, and again, it depends on what your career path is. If you're a songwriter, just a songwriter, if you're a, a, more of an artist, if you're both. But they have these gatekeepers, and, and it doesn't just stop there. They have, you know, if they're signed, they might have a radio team that talks about whether or not the song is going to good enough for the radio and what's happening in the radio space and what the sort of standards are for radio. And then they might have various members of their team. They might have management or whatever else. And then it gets into stuff like, you know, Spotify playlisters and editorial people. And then you get into radio station managers and radio programmers. All these people are incessantly inserting their opinions about creative output when you are a signed musician, right? And, mm -hmm. and, and, and we don't have that. We don't have any of that. And so we spend our c careers wondering why our stuff isn't, you know, reaching the same audience that we think it should reach, why we thought something was really going to pop and it didn't. And it's because we don't have those people doing it. And, and, and again, it's not like those kinds of gatekeepers are always right, it's all subjective, but you have this kind of pile, this 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 you know uh, uh, multitude of counselors. If you want to kind of speak biblically, you know, there's a bunch of people speaking in, and then they can kind of aggregate all those thoughts and do some math and say, okay, eighty percent of our team loves this song, and. 80% of our team has critiqued all the parts of it that they didn't love, blah, blah, blah. And now we have something that, that we feel good about. You know, and, and even then it still might fail, but we don't, but the point is we have none of that. Right. In, the independent has none of that. So we, it's on us to develop our own sense of that. Now, we still have people counseling us and speaking into our lives and hopefully they're smart about this, right? <laughs> but it's typically not their job. They're not going to make any more money or any less money if we, if we, follow their counsel and and they're not a lot of times professionals who even think with the same grid that 
maybe a professional uh, a, a label or, or publisher would. So that's kind of where I, I just you know started thinking you know so you had this I, I'll, I'll go back to my little four things I, I have four things that, that that I say about about music careers and it's the four things that you need the four the four ingredients for the for a recipe of a good music career are raw talent can you do the thing that you're trying to do do you write songs can you sing can you play can you whatever work ethic can will you work hard will you will you receive correction and be teachable and 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 do the work third would be um, how are you in a room? Can you go into rooms, collaborative rooms or sales type rooms? Can you be a person who interacts with people with regard to your art and sells it or or works on it or critiques it or tweaks it or whatever? And then finally, the fourth, it's just the suck meter. Do you have a sense of what's good and not good about what you do? And and Brian, the, the thing about the suck meter is that... If you don't have it, you probably don't know that you don't have it. And this is the hardest word that we could give to most of, the, of our li- li- listeners is, you, you, it's a good chance you just don't have this. And that's not because I'm smarter than you or better than you. Honestly, when I was starting out, I didn't ha- have it. Hmm. And, and, and so what, what the result is, we are constantly, and every person listening is gonna identify with this next part, we are constantly either saying, my stuff is awesome. Why doesn't anyone get it? Or my stuff is awful. I'll never be good. There's there's just these like extremes of mm. I'm this thing song I just wrote is, is is incredible. I don't know why people aren't aren't buying in. Or oh geez, my songs are all bad and blah blah. And we just we, we just don't have that. We don't have yeah. a proper view, yeah. right? So I I don't know. Do you have thoughts you know on that stuff so far? <sighs> I do um, a couple thoughts. Well, the second one I'll get to because I'm sure, I'm sure it'll come up. But but talking about all the labels and stuff, right? Like all of that thing, and we could definitely probably and probably will do episodes just on the behind the scenes because like most people think like you get a record deal, it's like oh well you deal with your label and that's it. But there's like you just hinted at, there's actually like teams upon teams upon teams that are kind of making it and all setting their own thresholds of barometers. And like you said, at the end of the day, even if everyone says this is a massive successful song career, whatever. That actually doesn't necessarily mean it's going to work. I mean, chances are due to the experience of the people involved, because they are the professionals, they do earn a living doing this, that they're probably going to be more right than wrong, or at least more often than a normal person. But what I'm getting at, for those of us who don't have that, how what's your, been your experience so far with like the artists that are signed? Do they actually have a good suck meter, or do they just got enough raw talent that they are able to be surrounded by people who actually can do that for them? Or do they have a good sense of it for themselves? Because I know that you've worked with, written with, had lots of cuts with signed right. artists. So what has that experience been like for you? Well, I mean, I'm sure it's, I'm, I'm sure the answer varies, right? And I'm sure yeah. that those who last um, have it, right? I mean, like I've, I, mean, I remember hearing stories years ago when, when Garth Brooks w- was a big deal, you know, the stories would be that, you know, people called him Jesus behind his back because he he just thought he was God or whatever. Which I'm not. That may not be true, but I'm saying like. He, but yeah. but the part of that was he was so controlling of every aspect. Like there'd be stories that he would tell the drummer what to do, and I don't know if Garth Brooks even plays drums or even understands the mechanics of drums or even yeah. knew the terms right. But he would tell drummers what to do. Mm. And I remember being with Chris Tomlin years ago, and this isn't me name dropping because I mean, sadly. You know, we were really good friends when we were in college, and he ended up being super famous, and I'm where I am. You know, but but Chris and I were were, were friends, and I even played in some bands with him in in college and stuff. And I remember he would really control things, hmm. and at the time it probably got on got on my nerves. But it's because he had a sense of what was good, like he right. really knew what to do. And yeah. again, when I when I say good, I should probably be using air quotes. Like he had a sense of what made sense to him and what he thought people would like. Right, because this is all about like what's going to be received, and so I, I think some of what you're asking is not so much do they have a sense of what's good, but do they have a sense of what they can do that will be received well, mm. right? And yeah. I don't know how to answer that question except that the ones who last over time, I think, have to get it. If they don't get it, I don't know how they don't get it, right? Because if right. they don't get it, then they're not, they're not going to last, right? Because they're either going to be furious at all their gatekeepers who continue to tell them that they're wrong, yeah, and continue to be proven right, you know, right? So like, so like, if they have a bad suck meter, right, and they're like, no, no, this song's great, and their gatekeepers like, okay, fine, we're going to release that, and it bombs, and then they have songs they go, this song isn't great, I hate it, and the gatekeepers are like, this song is great. Well, oh, 
over time that they would either learn or they'd probably get get sort of like so there's to be so much friction they wouldn't be able to last right right um but i tend to see that friction as as a chisel that chisels down chisels you down to a really fine point of knowing of knowing what's good right and and again i've the the, the interesting part of this is that you mentioned uh, I've been at this for, th- for nearly 30 years, and I had that suck meter pretty high now, and I don't mean that to brag. I'm saying, like, it's taken me 30 years, and it's, and mine's pretty finely tuned. Yeah. And part of why I, I harp on this idea is that not, not all of us have 30 years mm-hmm. to do this. Like, right. I didn't think I'd be at it for, for 30 years, so I'd, want, I'd like for all of you to get your suck meter figured out way quicker than 30 years. Yep. And I've only got it because I have been indie, I have been published. I have been. I've written CCM songs. I've written worship songs. I've written singer songwriter songs. I've written sync music. I've written in country. I've written camp theme songs. I've written jingles. I mean, I can go on and on and on. I perform yep. concerts for churches. I perform concerts at coffee house. I perform concerts for young kids. I perform concerts for older people. I've performed concerts for non Christians. I've done all those things, and over a really, really, really slow process i've learned this stuff that a label and a publisher would would give you a lot faster right and Mm. so again you and i are serving in this moment as a go-between of hey not most people listening to this podcast probably won't end up with a publisher or with a record label they they might i hope they do if that's what that's what the lord has for them but but if they don't they got to figure this out some some other way and so and like you said, I mean, do these artists have it? I don't know, but 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 when you have at least have access to someone giving it to you, it's like a chance for you, you know, to kind of say, mm-hmm. okay, I received this, and and I, and I want and and I want to be clear, every writer, every artist will have moments when everyone says something that you disagree with, and you should stick to your guns. Yeah, but I'm saying if that's just the norm, you you probably need to need need to learn to be humble and teachable more right because not everybody you know if the common denominator is everyone <laughs> the common denominator is that you're always the one that disagrees it's probably you right that's right. doing every that every single I mean, car on the road is a bad driver it, it may exactly. be you <laughs> it may be that you're a bad driver yeah so so that that's the thing is i don't know if those people you know walk into it with it but i do know there are people like I, I think these these um, these icon artists that we know of mm-hmm. uh, do have it. You know, like yeah. like I mentioned Garth Brooks, Elvis Presley, Michael ja- Jackson, Lady Gaga, Madonna. I know you may not like those people, but I'm saying those are like icon artists. Right. And you get into something like on Christian Space, Mercy Me, and 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 Chris Tomlin. They have it. Yep. You know, they've got it. And you and I might even disagree about it, but that it, that doesn't matter. They have proven it with the numbers. And don't hear us saying that equals success. We're talking about, when we say a suck meter, what the general public would want or what you as an artist and your audience are kind of doing, right? And that's a whole other thing. And we can talk about, talk about that in just a minute. But, you know, there is the mass public suck meter and right. there is the my calling, my people, my thousand true fans or whatever suck meter. And that's yeah, different. And I, yeah, and I think... Some people are just born with a commercial output. It's just what, when they just do things, it just has a commercial twist to it. Absolutely. And some people don't. And that is g- fine because like you just said, a thousand true fans, I mean, you you don't need to be in the radio of a thousand true fans. I mean, there's a thousand people in your neighborhood right now. You just have to be, sell them all cookies or something and they're trying, whatever, a thousand true fans. Yes. But but like, so it doesn't take that much because the whole idea, and if, if you haven't heard the thousand true fans thing, it's essentially, if you have a thousand people pay a hundred dollars towards your artistry to your music journey every year, that's a mm-hmm. six figure income, which is, you know, a great full time living and it only takes, and you can do the math however you want, 500 people, $200, whatever, whatever that looks like. But, right. Some people are born with that commercial lean. And those people, though, just like all the names you just listed, 
they may have been born and inclined to that, but they still developed it over career. And that's why we're still talking about them, even though a lot of people you mentioned aren't even with us anymore, because right. what they did and their suck meter was so strong that their songs will live on for- Wait, you think Elvis is dead? <laughs> oh, oh, Brian. <laughs> I think he's on the moon, uh, right? Okay, uh, good. That's, yeah. yeah. Uh, yeah. But I wanted to say this too. Now, besides, because no one listening to this podcast has the everything I do is awesome to quote from Lego movie. You know, we, mm. we're all after this, we're all humble human beings and we're going after it. So what are some like tips or ideas or strategies to actually develop our suck meter? I know because yeah. obviously there's a lot of, a lot of ways to, to do that. But like in your experience, how did you go from starting out when you said it wasn't very good to now yeah. where you're, you know, getting cuts, you're getting, you have, you have a charting song on the radio right now. Like right. how did you develop your personal suck meter? Right. And again, you know, mine's flawed. It is. Yeah. It is what I have, right? It sucks, um, right? <laughs> yeah, it sucks. Uh, but I, um, I'll, I'll tell a quick story, and that is that. And and I have this friend. His name's Corey. And when I tell this story, he always gets so upset because it makes him sound like a jerk. But it's a great and and powerful story in my in my journey. But when I was in college, this guy Corey was a worship leader at this Bible study that ended up being a really big deal that I, I led for later on but he was just a guy that played guitar and sang he, he didn't have any aspirations for a big music career but he was in college and played guitar well sang well and so he was leading worship at this thing and I was he was a couple years older than me and he was a mentor to me very godly man really cool and I made these original recordings I was my first ever you know tapes they were literal tapes that I, that I made of like my music this is early 90s and I remember you know no no one but the independent music wasn't a thing really then right. there was just no internet so it wasn't you just didn't have a lot of indie stuff and here i was making uh, music and putting it out you know selling it for two or three bucks whatever you know and and so everyone was enamored by it in spite of the fact that it probably wasn't very good you know i wasn't great uh, or even close but they didn't know anybody else that made music so they're like oh this guy ross and he wrote he wrote his own songs and made a tape you know so i remember giving him one and I, he listened to it for a couple of days, and I, I said, "Hey, what do you think about that?" You know, and I'm just all I'm hearing from people is that I'm I'm awesome, right? Yeah. And he says to me basically, "I I, I like this, okay, but I wouldn't pay for it if you weren't my friend," you know. And you know, it sounds awful, right? But I mean, but but he but and he reminded me recently when I when I told him about about how I'd share this story, and he was embarrassed, and he said, "Well, you're forgetting one else, one other thing that I said to you." And I said, "What's that?" He said, "I said." I probably wouldn't pay for Stephen Curtis Chapman's first ever demo tape either. It's probably not very good, you know. Yeah. And 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 he's and that's the point is that he was like saying, "Look, you you want to be so good that it doesn't matter if I'm your buddy. I love this and I need it in my life and I want it, right?" So so that that, that sets the stage for for what has really been a a 25 year journey for me of of like learning this. And and again, let me say, if I go before about the year 2001 or 2, I don't want you listening to, to my mu music. It's mm. I don't, and I had a five or six year career before that, and I don't want you hearing it. And there's stuff since 2001 or two that I wouldn't love for you, for you to hear. <laughs> but but it's slowly gotten better. And now I'm at a place, I think I told you this the other day, I'm at a place now where I'm not worried at all about what I put out because now it's just like, oh, I, I know what I can do. Yeah. And, and again, let me clarify, I'm talking this moment about Ross King music, my own music I release as an artist, not like when I go write CCM songs or whatever else. So, all that to say that 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 was the beginning of my journey, and and then a few years ago, as I started to coach other people, other songwriters, I started thinking about this, trying to kind of put it in a you know I want to make it an easier to remember curriculum, and so I came up with this this sort of process that I really believe in, and it's what I call attention awareness authority, and this is how you get a suck meter, okay? And it's mm -hmm. and, it, and it's as, it's as simple as as can be, all right? But none of us want to do it, and it's pay attention to all kinds of things, to the critiques that you get to what's happening in the genre of music that that you are pursuing at all levels at the indie level at the at the radio level at the at the whatever mm -hmm. pay attention uh, to the 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 friction that you run into as you create pay attention to the response that that you're getting from both fans and people who you would never think are fans uh, pay attention to the industry response that you get if you're seeking professional responses from you know song pluggers or from publishers or labels pay attention to all of that 
And then pay attention to even what's happening in, in music outside of your genre so that you know kind of influences, blah, blah, blah. So all that's your attention piece. That gives you awareness. Now, now you are aware of your own strengths and your own weaknesses in writing. Oh, I'm more of a lyric person. Oh, I think I'd write better in the mornings. Oh, I tend to do better if I'm at the piano, even though I'm a guitar player. Mm. Stuff like that. Oh, when I'm put in a room and there's a track, I'm really... I'm better than I thought I was, you know, uh, think, think, things like that, right? There's, there's, there's different kinds of things that you can get aware of. Yeah. And then when you have all of that, then you have authority. And the authority is really just confidence is that, you know, it just doesn't start with an A, so I didn't do that. But, but, but the authority piece is, oh, I now know what I think I should be doing in these moments, the authority to, to receive Brian's correction on my song and then say, I don't feel threatened by it. I have authority. Okay, I'm going to listen to him. You know, or I really believe in this and I think I think Brian's wrong and I have authority to do that. I have the authority to say no to a co-write that I think is going to make the song harder or whatever. I I have the authority to to step into a room and play the song and feel confident. You know, yeah. that kind of thing. So so that, you know, and and in practically speaking, part of how that's done is becoming a person who is able to critique what you love and to respect what you hate. Okay. So that's, mm. that's the other piece of this. And I, and again, I think I've told you this per- personally, but I literally like work really hard to engage with music, both artists and genres that I don't like and, f- and make myself assess what's working, why it's good. Mm. And then I take my favorite artists and my favorite kind of music. I step back and say, this isn't great, you know. So if you're if you're if you're one of those people, for for example, who won't admit that U two isn't any good now as a as a songwriting band, then you know your suck meter's terrible. I'm just being be that's I don't try to be mean. I'm saying they were an incredible creative force. Now they go and you watch their concerts and they play old stuff. That's okay. They are really really good at that. Don't don't be a person who can't admit that you two hasn't written more than one or two really good songs in the last 15 years. If you can't do that, you don't have a suck. I'm sorry. You don't have a good suck. Meter. That's, I don't care if that's controversial. It just is. And don't be a person who can't admit if you hate rap, that can't admit that Kendrick L- Lamar or NF are, are really talented. You have to have that. That's how you get it. Because if you can't be honest about them, then you sure can't be honest about yourself. Right. Yeah, that's good. So those are a few of my sort of like techniques: is the attention, awareness, and authority, and then the actual critique what I love, respect what I hate. Yeah, I remember when we did your episode on the podcast last year. You mentioned uh, levitating, right? And I was like, do do, do a little yeah. yeah, yeah, and the baby, yeah, yeah, the baby, of course, the um, baby, and right? You can't miss him. And then like I was like, well, I was like, what? And I knew the song, and I, you know, I got the. But then, like, I was like, yeah, 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 yeah. And I was like, right, he's so right. Like, yeah, she says yeah five times, and it's a legitimate hook of Ugh. the word yeah that I'll never forget my whole we life. Need tonight. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, that's like so hooky. It's so it's good. crazy. And the whole, the whole rhythms of the verses and everything. And mm-hmm. then there's been that whole big like copyright thing going on, whatever. But like, yeah. it's like I don't listen to Dua Leap on. She's not on any of my playlists. And I'm not, right. I'm not afraid to say guilty pleasure music. She just doesn't happen to be that for me. But sure, like, sure. I still respect that glorious thing that you can turn a yeah into a smash hit. Yeah. You know. Yes. If yeah. you're rolling your eyes at Doja Cat, I'm sorry. You're wrong. It's you don't have to like it, but that is hooky stuff. Yeah. She raps. The hooks and the, the vocal hooks in the, in the songs are undeniably catchy. It's not lyrically interesting. That's not what I'm talking about. Yeah. We have to be able to sing. It's probably bad. Honestly. Right. right. <laughs> yes. Exactly. And 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 so we have to be kind of people who can step into these like, okay, why is Post Malone working? Why is mm. Drake working? I don't like Drake at all. But I look at it and go, something in this sort of cultural moment is is drawn to this. Mm. And I want I do I have to figure it out. And it may not have any impact on my actual creative output. But if I can't learn to like appreciate things that the culture embraces, even if they're kind of like offensive to me, where I just appreciate that the culture appreciates them, that there's a there's a window into my own creative stuff there. And listen, there are hardcore faith Christians who are going to say that what we're doing here is compromising, and I get it. 
I'm just saying, I'm talking strictly about take all the emotion out of it. What is working in the culture, receiving music and, and you know, that, that kind of thing. Yeah. And I think I'm hearing it like, and this is a little goofy, but it does make sense. It's don't hate the player, hate the game, right? Like that's literally exactly. It. Like, no, it actually, actually is that because <laughs> you can be bothered that the culture likes this. Right. But okay, great. Got it. Now step back and say, why does the culture like it? And don't just say because it's dirty or because it's, you know, sexy. It's, don't, don't, that, that's not the only, there are, that's part of it. But I couldn't pick Doja Cat out of a lineup in terms of her visual look. I don't have a clue who she is, what she, what she, she looks like. I'm just saying when it's on, I'm like, geez, that's, that's really hooky. Yeah. And it's like, you know, I'm looking here at Spotify's like today's top hits, which is like 31 million, 760, whatever, like crazy. Mm -hmm. Okay. The number one song is Harry Styles as it was. Now that's because it was a, it probably still is a TikTok sound, big sound, you know, Mm -hmm. but like that song has just repeated phrases. There's no melodic change. It's like static melodies. It has like an 80s vibe. It is nothing new. It's basically a copy of of Take On Me. Exactly. uh Totally. Yeah, Yeah, but not nearly as interesting, right? Right, right. And but it's number one. So there's a reason. No, and so I tell I tell my students, if you're worried that your suck meter isn't that good, you start your day every few days by picking two or three genres. Some you're into, some you're not, and listening to the top playlists of those genres. Pop, Christian, uh, gospel, bluegrass, country, world music, you know, whatever it is, singer, songwriter, and you're going to have music that you don't like. And as soon as you hear it, if you can tolerate it, ask yourself, why is this on the top? Why is this? Why is everybody like this? Yeah. You know, what is it? What's happening here? And I'm telling you, there's almost, not to spiritualize this, but there's almost a, a, a little bit of like grace in doing that saying what's the heart of the world longing for mm. yeah all right and they may not be getting it from this in any sort of like life-saving way but why you know w- why do they want this my son and i went to a julia M- michaels concert a couple years ago before the just before the, the pandemic i guess it was just before i don't know but julia michaels is this moderately successful uh, a pop artist but she's a very successful s- songwriter in the pop world written tons of songs and she's this kind of potty mouthed you know, a cynical person who also on stage seems very, very happy and joyful. And so mm. I knew taking my 16 year old son there, there was going to be, he's going to hear some, some cursing and whatever <laughs> else, but I just, but he it was his idea. He wanted to go. He's a big fan. So, so we went and, and, and the, the, it was this, it was in this standing room, room only place, literally there didn't have any chairs and about a thousand people. And it's probably 80% uh, girls and 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 young women and then me and Sam and a few other men you know and <laughs> and she does this great show great 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 show and the crowd goes wild and everyone's singing along all the words including all the profanity and all that not us but the rest of the people who are sinners they were all singing the the, the profane words no but when when we left you know I, I got in the car with my son and, and and I said Sam we just saw what Christian music is supposed to be wow. which is solidarity, singing the top of their lungs, every single word fully in. And by the way, she's singing a lot of like heavy emotional health stuff, breakups, grief, anger, life with a smile on her face the entire time. Yeah. Yeah. Real life. Yeah. The whole, the whole crowd singing top of their lungs. And, and I said, but here's the sad thing. People left that show and in an hour, nothing from that show is going to carry them really farther. Yeah. Not to be mean, but there's nothing about what she said that's like real life in yeah. Jesus, real eternity. Yeah. And I was like, we, we're supposed to have that kind of engagement. And I'm getting a little bit off, off topic, but what I'm trying to say is I saw that as that's something I want to do with my music. I just have the gospel, and she's not talking about, about the gospel, right? But I want to have that kind of like everyone wants to sing along. Everyone wants to be in on this. You know, yeah. that's what a suck meter does is it says, this isn't just about me. It's what are people, and again, whatever people God's called you to, what are, how are people going to receive this? You know, yeah. And you can't always know, right? But we're trying to learn so that we're not shocked when someone says, that chorus sounds kind of like that verse. And you're like, mm-hmm. what? You should, you should know that already. You should already know that. And, you, and, and your, interest, your interest should be, yeah, on purpose. 
right? If you're shocked when someone says things about your song, you never thought of these certain critiques, then your suck meter needs to get worked on. Yeah. Okay. So two things, one short, and then one's like a follow-up question. So I think a lot of people, including myself included, will hear a song. I'll I'll pick on Harry Styles again, because I'm thinking about it. Like you can go, oh, that song's so simple. I could do that, you know? And I don't know (laughs) if that's actually true, because even though it comes across like this mindless, pointless thing, like there's a lot to it. There's a lot of craft because there's a reason that it's it's where it's at. So it, kind of like pointing out like what you're saying, like in a way, it's almost like a, it gives us an advantage because we can take, we can see like what is like owning the charts or Spotify or whatever. And then how do we do that in a way that's true to us, of course, first of all, because that's the only way that it actually is going to reach people. But secondly, infuse hope into that thing because if we couldn't hear these songs and we wouldn't know have any idea how to reach people but we're seeing we can see what's actually resonating with the world in a big way so how can we do that in our own way and infuse eternity into it right like i think so that's it's actually cool that we can see those things mm-hmm. on these kind of charts these days i wanted to follow up and ask you this because i know this is a thing that a lot of people are plagued with is the idea of perfectionism and then when it comes into flow, because there's someone out there listening right now is probably like, yeah, you know, I think my suck meters, you know, humbly, I think it's pretty good. Like I have an idea of what's good and what's not, but I'm just not going to put anything out because I know that I'm never going to reach my own internal perfectionism. I'm never going to. So what? how do you speak to that? Like give yourself grace as you go, you know, because right. like it's a development thing, right? Like you said now at 30-ish years in, you're like, I feel like I know that whatever I, my output is is going to exceed my own personal suck meter. But that's coming through a lot of stuff that you literally told us, like, we don't, you don't want people to hear the first six years of you doing this, you know? So, right. like, how do you right. fight through that idea of, like, I'm not going to put anything out because it's never going to meet my, my suck meter that's too high, if that makes sense. Right, right. No, and what's funny about that's a perfect... You know, the way you set that up is perfect because I have fans because of those first five or six years. So I'm obviously wrong about that, right? I mean, yeah, I'm not because I'll look back and go, I don't like those songs. But, I, but, it, but it insults my fans from those early years if I say that yeah. stuff's bad. Because they'd yeah. say, no, what are you talking about? That's some of, that's your, some of your best stuff, most honest, whatever. So part of it is you got to realize is that your refined suck meter will actually make you sometimes too critical of those like early sort of happy accidents, those early... A- explorations into your art and some of you are in some of the listeners are in those early explorations right Right. and and so i would just say know this i'm trying to do a very commercial thing i have to do a very commercial thing because i'm writing in in the sort of as a staff writer kind of thing where i'm writing for other artists and for sync i have to have that and so part of this is that that seeped into my singer songwriter thing where it really didn't have to seep in i was i had my thousand thousand ish true fans a while ago with that stuff that I don't even like as much, right? Mm, so yeah. it, it, you, it's it's it all it's all about like what you want to do. I mean, I had this I had a conversation with a guy yesterday. I had breakfast with a guy who was asking me about pub deals, you know. And I've said this to you before, Brian. I mean, when someone says to me, "How do I get a pub deal? How do I get a, a record deal? How do I get on the DSPs?" Whatever, I say, "Well, tell me what you want. What you actually? What's the result that you want?" Like, not, I want a pub deal, and if that's the result, that's a, not a good result. But I want to have songs doing this. Okay, yeah, maybe what's that's the goal you know, behind the goal, right? Yeah, what's the goal behind, right, right. So, I, you know, I'd like to be on the radio. I'd like to be playing concerts in other states in these kinds of settings, blah, 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 okay? Mm-hmm. And, if, and, and then if, you, if getting a pub deal or a record deal gets you that, and you can see, we can see like a measurable, okay, this is how that happens. Like this, these people get, get pub deals, then they go on to do this, they go on to do this. Okay. That then suddenly, then you know why you want a pub deal. But I would say that all of us, I mean, the Lord made you to do something, lots of things, but with, with regard to your creative, creative output and your impact on the culture and, and, and on the world, the Lord made you to, to do something. And, and again, might be more than one thing, but you have to figure out, well, what kind of suck meter sort of, you know, it's like um, your radio in your car, you know, has stations and you move that dial around. And if you're looking only for country, you are, you will hear in the first few bars of every station that, that you pass. Oh, that's country. That's not right. You'll have a sense of that. And even maybe even more finely tuned, like I like old country or I like whatever. Okay. So, so you have to figure out what, 
what influences, what voices, what what sort of shaving away, chiseling away stuff you're going to pay attention to because it matters to your goal, you know, or it matters to this goal. Like, again, I have, I have music I make as an artist, mm-hmm. and it has a certain kind of suck meter in my brain, and I have music that I make for sync, which is film, TV, ad, and it has a suck, certain kind of suck meter, and it's a very different from mine from my artist stuff and I have one for CCM and then I have one for different kinds of CCM. I have one for worship. I have, you know, and again, there's concentric circles all through there. They're all about high quality and those high quality moments are going to be concentric. But when I'm writing Ross King music, I don't think about a bunch of that stuff. Mm. And, and, And in fact, there are hookier elements or more mass, appeal elements that I'll actually reject sometimes because I'm like, nah, I, that's not what I do really. I have this group of fans who expects this and it seems like if I'm only going to get their ears three and a half minutes at a time every once in a while, whatever, I want to say these specific things because they can hear that. They can hear that by turning on K- Caleb. I, I, I don't need to say, say that. You know, I've told you before, I, this is our first podcast that we did together. I said, I write in the spaces, right? So you get to figure out which of those lanes you are dealing with for the suck meter, right? And it breaks down, right? Because it's not going to be like an exact formula, but it's just that we're trying to get honest about what we're really doing, and we're trying to get ahead of these sort of shocking, demoralizing critiques by saying, I can see that that's a, that, that's a flaw in what I do. I can see that that's a deficit in what I do. Mm. So I'm going to find ways to, to either complement that by bringing in someone else, or I'm going to work on that area a bunch. Or I'm going to stop trying to do that area. You know, this is all productivity stuff, right? I mean, yeah. do you lean into your strengths? Do you lean into your weaknesses? All those things. But yeah, so that's, for me, that's kind of, you know, the way I, I approach it is it just depends on what I'm making because there are, I could get hypercritical using the wrong suck meter. I could say, well, this song isn't as good as what, as what you know, uh, Mercy Me just put out. Well, that's, if that's not what I'm doing, it doesn't matter, right? Or this song is, is more cryptic than blah, blah, blah. Well, if I'm, going, if I'm the kind of person who writes a, more of a cryptic lyric, okay, that's okay. If that's who I'm trying to reach, right? Uh, because, because again, you know, we, I'm not telling people to become like predictable, homogenized, vanilla thing. I'm saying you have to be honest about what you're not good at and what you are good at and work on that. That's all I'm getting at. It's not that I'm trying to make you into something that you're not. I'm trying to get you to be the best of you that you are, that you can be. But that yeah. involves you knowing when you didn't do something well. Mm. And, and, and I'll say it again, just in case they missed in the beginning, you probably don't have this as good as you think. You just probably don't. I don't have it as good as I think. We, it's, it's always being refined. And we cannot separate. I mean, even get into biblical, you know, Psalm 139, 23, 24, you know, the psalmist says, search me, God, know my heart, because I don't know my own heart. Test me, know my thoughts, because I don't know my own thoughts. You tell me if there's anything wicked in me, and then you lead me in the everlasting way, right? Because I won't know if there's anything wicked. And that's on a spiritual level. So that's certainly true with, is this song a hook? Is this lyric saying what I think it says? Man. Okay, so you took on a spiritual kind of preaching. Side. I'm kind of preaching a little bit. I'm no, going, you know, whatever. Well, it's okay, it's whatever. Thing, but think about this. It is good. God, in literally the beginning of it all, has a suck yes. meter for creation. Ooh. Now you got it. Right? Yes. I mean, amen. it is good because God is, the, is I don't want to say God is a suck meter because that sounds strange, but like, yeah. obviously, that's modeled. And yes. how it, his point of reference is he's the creator of all, so he knows what's good and God is good. But that means right. it's modeled to come through all of us as we That's create right. art, especially as we create art for him to reach other people with him. So wow. this is, I mean, a suck meter is a cool, like catchy title and it's true, but there is a lot of weight and mm. depth to it. It's more than just that. So, and and one thing I, that I wanted to say, and I want to like kind of, kind of wrap up, but like, like you'll have some like closing thoughts or encouragement for the, the development of suck meter. But I want to say too, like something that I've personally experienced after I just punched the mic is that like, Probably as you develop, you're you're developing your suck meter along with your thi- your skin is getting thicker and skin gets mm-hmm. thicker through scar tissue. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Like yes. you have to be able to take it because like if you're just like 
everything I do is amazing and no one ever will tell me otherwise, that means that probably no one's hearing your stuff. And hopefully, you know, you are born that way, but in most, I would say probably every case, it's a developmental lifelong pursuit. Even like you mentioned Mercy Me. I love the Mercy Me movie. I don't you know, necessarily like love all their songs, but I can recognize why they're on the radio 25 years yes. later. Is, you know, someone said, oh, Bart Millard said, I wrote, I can only imagine in 20 minutes. And they said, no, you didn't. You wrote it in 30 years. You know, like yeah, right. that That's right. came through every song he ever wrote was a result of that in his own life experience. But you have to have thick skin. You have to be able to take critique and say, like you said before, sometimes you take it with a grain of salt and you're like, okay, you know, I get it, but I'm still using that word because that's important to me. And for my particular output and audience, that's the word that needs to be in there. But if you're going for a commercial thing, right. you might need to revisit that if you're speaking to a, you know, a publisher in right. that world that you're trying to work with, you know, that's what you say. The suck meter can kind of change depending on where you put it, you know, but, right. but just getting into that, like, it takes it takes a lot of no's. It takes a lot of rejection. It takes a lot of critique. It takes a lot. Of, and I've heard it said, you know, great songs aren't written; they're rewritten. You know, like, mm, and that comes yeah. through taking critique, and that comes through actually being okay with saying, okay, I'm going to scrap the verses because they're junk. The chorus is good, the hook is good, but the verses just aren't working. You have to be okay right. with that because you know that there's no such thing as like that'll do. Because yeah, you can just write. We've all done it. I did it for like the beginning, probably the first 15 years of my songwriting. It's like, oh well, these words look cool so they're going to be good they meant nothing to anyone you know so it's like right until you start going with the fine tooth comb and start actually tearing up your stuff and then that's right. i think that's the big pursuit of actually developing you know your own personal bar of quality so like right you know what are some like closing thoughts encouragement you can give to whoever's listening as they're kind of digging into this whole thing just give up it's not gonna work <laughs> um no i would say click <laughs> <laughs> it would Ross, have just there? ended Ross, right there. Ross, and you just see my head just against his microphone, <laughs> just tears falling, just dripping. Um, no, I, tears are I, salty. <laughs> I um, there's so much, but I, I part of this is I you, when you said a minute ago, you know, you you would that'll do was kind of the way you approached your your lyrics. I did that with with melody for years, and one mm. of the hardest things about a sort of localized career or ministry is that if you want to stay where you are and that's not a that's not a veiled insult if you want to stay where, where you are and you have people where you are who like what you do the way you do it then do just do that your suck yeah. meter is good enough it's fine for what you're doing and if you land on some gig that's just like a dream gig and you know it's 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 a localized version of you're the tonight show band and you just got to play groovy hooks you know for the commercial breaks some Bruno Mars stay with it (laughs) stay with it that's awesome right if you're happy there right and for years I was doing independent music and I phoned in my melodies my lyrics I won't I don't have no problem saying my lyrics were strong that's what I was good at and and everyone's like oh and so so I get so much compliment on the lyric that I would avoid that, that I would really not think about the melodic properties. And then later on I started noticing how melody moved me and it wasn't in my own songs. Mm. And so I would say one is pay attention as much to what your compliments, what kind of flattery and compliments and 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 you know ego strokes that, that you're getting as critiques, because you will buy, why wouldn't you? You will believe in and those critiques, those, those um compliments aren't wrong. They're just one part of it. Mm. So you know, and ask yourself, do I want something besides what people are saying about this? You know, and then I would just say that neither you or I, and I know you would agree, w- want people to hear you, you, your first instinct is always wrong. That's not what we're saying. No songs are written in 10 minutes. That's not what we're saying. Every song has to be, you know, looked at with a fine tooth comb all the time. No, that's, that's not what we're saying. This is about goals. If you want to be the artist that you've decided that you that you want to be, irrespective of how much money you make, how much reach you have, you just want to do what you do, you do that. And don't worry about anything we're saying. I hope you quit. I hope you stopped listening to this 30 minutes ago, if that's you, all right? But if you want more, and again, if if that more sounds to me like selling out, sounds to you like selling out or whatever, I, I don't know what to say to you, except I wanted this to be my job, and it now is, yeah. all right? And I'm not rich, but I'm doing all right. And I wanted more. I wanted a wider appeal in what I was doing in all the areas at varying de- degrees. You know, my, my artist career is different. But when I write a sync song, I am absolutely thinking about what Target would play 
and I and that sometimes is complicated. Okay, when I write CCM songs, a recurring joke I have, and Brian's probably heard me say this, a recurring joke I have is that there are certain producers and writers in this town who every time I write with them, my favorite lyric I'm working on in that moment is the one that they, they, will, they will laser point out and say, I liked it, Ross, except that one lyric, and I'll think, that's exactly what I love about this, <laughs> right? And here's the thing, Brian, they're right. Mm. I'm wrong. They have multiple hits on the radio. Now you're gonna say, Ross, wrong. I say, no, I mean wrong in this context. Right. My lyric might be better in some kind of creative songwritery way. And they may I'm not even saying, disagree with that. They may say it's that's better, right. But, that's but. right. But in the room, my goal is to write for that artist for the radio to make money. Yep. That's my goal. It just is. Now I want to preach Jesus. I'm not saying like I'm gonna compromise the truth. I'm saying I, my goal is to get the widest possible audience onto Christian radio so that it makes money. And so it, it reaches people, all those things, all right? And they're right about that. In that moment, they know, what, they know what that is better than me. And I should be okay with that. But if my goal was to write a song that I want to release from me, well, then so what? Do what I want to do. I shouldn't be in the, in the first place yeah. with this guy who, who's writing songs for Chris Tomlin, Lauren Daigle, whatever. That's silly for me to be in that room, you know? Mm. They don't do what I do. So I, I've, I'm going too long, but I'm just trying to say, like, it's about find out what you want and finally tune your suck meter for that, for that goal. And you keep tuning it, keep tuning it, keep tuning it, while you also learn to use your suck meter to do other things that maybe you don't care as much about, but you just want to learn because you want to be good at the craft. You know, like in our intensives, we, we say, hey, we're going to write camp theme songs. We're, we're going to write hymns. We're going to write pop songs. We're, we're going to find ways to do things that we wouldn't normally do because it makes us better at this. And I'm glad you brought that up because, you know, a place, a great auditioning place. And not to say, you know, with there's the Christian New Yards and Songwriters Facebook group, which is a great sounding board. But with that, you know, we always try to make it to where we're encouraging each other. So go and post your songs, put links to your songs, but give us some backstory about the song. Tell us why you wrote mm -hmm. it. Tell us what it was for. You know, like Ross is saying, like, what is your goal for this particular song? And not that you have to like, because it could feel like a lot of pressure, but as far as like in the professional career minded, like you kind of have to have your target in mind yeah. as you do this stuff right. or else it just, right. it just could be for fun. You know, and that's great if it's right. just for fun. But if you're trying to earn an income and do this, because the thing is, I've heard it said like, you have to make money with what you do or else you have to do something else, you know? And, and if right. that's okay, like if, if you have a nine to five and then you do songwriting the week, whatever, like that's amazing. And honestly, there's a lot less pressure in that. But a lot of people I think listening to this are trying to go further and do it more. And so that requires developing your suck meter in within the context of your target and goal. And two, I would say that that may be revealed over time. You might start off being a worship leader and you write songs for your, for your church, and then all of a sudden you might write something that's a little bit more poppy and realize that you might be a CCM writer or you might be a, right. who knows, a pop writer, whatever the case may be, because it's a moving target. But like setting a goal mm -hmm. and an expectation for each song is definitely the way to develop yourself along the way, right? When people want to give me songs to critique, I always say, before we start, what's your reasonable dream for this song? And I mm -hmm. mean like... Don't tell me, oh, I hope it's Lauren Daigle's num number one hit and I make a million dollars. That's not reasonable. It may happen, but it's not reasonable. But right. I say, what's your reasonable dream? Do you want church to sing this? Do you want, do you want to record this somewhere? Do you, and, and I'll, you know, and I'll kind of get that backstory, you know, what's, and then, and then, I, then I critique it for that because I can't just critique it with no, no guardrails, with, with, with no parameters. I have to know, well, because well, there are times when I, I would grade a song, you know, D plus that's actually an A if I just knew what they were trying to do with it. Oh, I mean, if someone says, hey, I, I, I want to play this new song by John Mark McMillan and it has this line, sloppy, wet, wet, wet a kiss. I'd like to play it for the, for my parents' very fundamentalist Baptist church. I'm giving that song a D. And then they say, I want to play it for a bunch of Gen Zers or whatever uh, who are just barely figuring out Jesus. I'd be like, yep, A plus, go for it. I love this. I'm glad that- Me too. You know, let Me people, too. I mean, I feel like this is literally like an endless well. We could do this every day. Good luck editing. Yeah. <laughs> I love editing so much. Edited vocals yeah, earlier today, and now I edit podcasts maybe tomorrow. But yeah, yeah. this will come out soon. And um, yeah, I love it. We'll keep doing this. But before we go, because I always do this, I'm just going to I'm gonna pray um, as we wrap up here. Mm -hmm. And then uh, so, so God, thank you so much for this time. Thank you so much for this conversation between Ross and I. And, and just uh, thankful for 
all the joint experiences we have and that anyone listening knows that you know we're saying all this with grace and truth you know it's not mm-hmm. just there's no right or wrong this is just in, as people are in pursuit of becoming better at the craft of songwriting because we know that our songs can actually reach people in a major way and probably you know the combination of God's power and, and the the emotional response of music is a combination unlike anything else we get to experience in life so as we are developing our own skills and our own parameters and learning how to do it better that's what this is all about so I heard that every Everyone, I pray that everyone who hears this knows that they can continue to push themselves further. And we're here to mm-hmm. help any way we can, God. So we thank you so much for your grace. We just pray increased creativity, increased awareness of ourselves as we pursue after you with this music. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen.